Welcome back to the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Let's now talk about COVID-19 palliatives and an alleged loot. The Senate Committee on Ethics, Privileges and Public Petitions has issued a warrant of arrest, and that's on the interim management of the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, because it refused to appear over an allegation that it diverted and misappropriated the sum of 6.2 billion Naira COVID-19 palliatives. The money was approved last year by President Muhammad Buhari to cushion the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Niger Delta region. But the money was reportedly released to the former Interim Management Committee of the NDDC, headed by Professor Keme Ponde, with Efyong Akwa, as well as two others as members. A former agitator, Sob Sobomabo Jack Rich, who was appointed by the president to chair the distribution of the palliatives, later raised the alarm. In a petition he sent to the Senate, he alleged that the NDDC management had diverted and misappropriated the 6.2 billion naira. And uh, members of the NDDC management have consistently refused to appear before the committee, and that's for about four times now. And that's why the Senate is now issuing a warrant for the arrest. We've now invited the program manager, Sislak and Transparency International Nigeria, Selmo Asimi, to discuss this with us. Good morning, Tamil. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Talking about the situation means we'll have to go back to when this all started and talking about corruption in the system as a whole. That money was disbursed for people of the Niger Delta. We saw how the COVID-19 took its toll. Businesses were shut down. Lots of, you know, basically the, most of the country was locked down and people needed to survive. The government, you know, distributed this money, disbursed this money for people to make living easier. And we see allegations here that it had been misappropriated and diverted. You know, in your work as an anti-corruption officer, what are your comments on this to start with? I think, um, first of all, it's, it's really very sad. It's, it's, it's not a good um, scene and it's not a good uh, sight to behold. When you hear all the stories, you look at the clips we had. We all experienced the pandemic. We are still having it currently. We saw how um, people struggled to feed during this period. We saw how um, you saw the looting of the warehouses, how hungry people were to the extent they had to actually break into warehouses. We saw how um, palliatives meant for individuals and for citizens were actually stored in warehouses by different individuals. At some point, there are lots of investig investigations going on, but we need to see results. Um, if, if, if you look at this critically, I think it all just points to the problem around corruption in this whole COVID-19 relief process. From uh, the issues of uh, individuals breaking into houses down to the NDDC issue and everything, it is something that really should be looked into and should be investigated. We had different number of persons bringing money. We had uh, the Kaka COVID, we had the IMF. The IMF gave us, I think, about $3.4 yeah, billion um, dollars in uh, the COVID uh, process. That's the rapid financial instrument that was supposed to go into the budget and everything. We are still waiting for the government to actually tell us how that was spent because part of the agreement the government had with the IMF, there were lots of agreements, some around audits, which we'll be expecting later this year. We we'll expect the government to uphold that. Some around having specific line items to trace these funds. We are still expecting some of all those things. So if you notice, lots of funds were pumped in and we raised concerns about this. We wrote an open letter to different actors around the government. We told them that, look, when there's a COVID relief or when there's a um, relief for a pandemic or a disaster, there's always a temptation to actually lose because what happens here is they, they, uh, people, people bypass different procurement frameworks. So we just say, okay, it's an emergency, it's an emergency, we shouldn't do the normal proper bidding, we should do the normal route of all these things, we just want because it's an emergency. And then the possibility of corruption actually increases and the corruption risk is also very, very high during this process. So as um, anti-corruption advocates on our part, this is really, really sad and that individuals won't honor the invitation of the National Assembly 
which has the mandate to oversight the institution, then it's really, really very bad. The, it's very bad for the country. Yeah, earlier, I think in 2019, uh, there was an order for a forensic audit of the NDD, NDDC's books. Um, I'm not sure how eventually that turned out or if there were any um, revelations from that audit. Um, now that these things have you know, taken place and we're talking about um, a misappropriation of 6.25 billion naira by the Interior Management Committee and the head of the NDDC, do you think that aside a Senate hearing that Nigerian government should give um, an order for another forensic audit of the books of the NDDC? I agree with you in the sense that there needs to be a proper investigation into this, like a proper investigation. We can't let this lie. This is a weighty allegation. I mean, at this point in time when we are having, we just struggle to exit a recession with 0.11%. That's really, really, really easy. We just wobbled out of it. We need all the funds we need to have. Yes, there should be a thorough investigation into this. It shouldn't be swept under the carpet. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be just paid by lip service alone. The root of the problem should be discovered. Anti-corruption agencies should also swing in, let us know if this was spent, where, how. If anybody is found guilty, the person should be brought to book. Because when, when um, you, you, you divert funds or when you are accused of misappropriating funds meant for citizens during a pandemic, then I think that's terrible. Because this is a time where people need all these funds and with health challenges and everything, you misappropriate funds at that point, then that's really, really bad. So I agree totally that there should be an investigation, not just say we launch it and we just leave it now. The public should be readily updated. anti graft agencies should swing in. And the Senate has its powers to ensure that it uses its powers to the fullest to make us go to the root of all this. Yeah, but... These are the issues... These are some of the challenges we face. You, you, uh, you had me a few weeks ago here talking about the corruption perception index. One of the indicators we mentioned is how the yes. criminal justice institution deals with cases like this. And you can see, as we both see, that this is failing how you prosecute individuals and them, politically exposed person who you think maybe have powers or are a bit up there amongst the one percent of the society. This is the these are the indices measured on the CPI, and that's why you see Nigeria dropped. So, so is this is this regular procedure, um, or do you think that we're dragging our feet with this issue? Because um, if we are still, you know, pleading for these people to come to a Senate hearing, you know, they've refused to show up four times. Now the Senate is talking about ordering, you know, the, for their arrest. Um, do you think that, you know, seeing the magnitude magnitude of this um, case, we sh the Senate should have long ago ordered the EFCC, the ICPC, and and the likes to do a forensic audit um, of their books or do are we do we need to go through the senate hearing process first before the efcc is brought in uh, i think that's the the issue of lack of coordination has been one of the issue in an anti-corruption process noticeable over the past few years in generally even in nigeria where we have different institutions trying to work around this the Senate has its powers as the oversight um, body of uh, the country, of institutions. The Senate can have, we can have a session where we have this in a kind of collective process. We shouldn't duplicate efforts by different entities. That's one. Looking at the question around if this is uh, the right time or if this is taking too long. Yes, this is taking too long. We understand there are times for investigations and the rest, but this is taking too long because you look at the amount involved. The amount involved is very much. This you're talking about billions of naira, that's really much. It's something that should take a swift action. I understand normally in the country, this is even a normal justice process. You know, you we had um, when, when when corruption cases are being investigated or monitored or being treated at different courts, you see taking five years, ten years to secure convictions that are now being appealed and the rest. This is not the way to go. This is not the way to go. This matter should be followed to the latter. Because the way and manner we, we the, the theatrics around all this, just last year, uh, at the Senate and the whole, the way and manner this went, it's, 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 it's embarrassing to the nation as well. It's really embarrassing because I had friends who were asking me from outside the country, what's going on? Why is it fainting? What's this, what's that? And I had to try explaining and everything. 
I mean, this is really sad. In terms of monuments for individuals who were struggling, who were on knockdowns at different points, and they didn't have anything to do. This should really, really be investigated. And it, should, it shouldn't be done in a way everybody does their investigating at different points. Now, there should be harmony, there should be synergy, and it should be done in a coordinated manner with the public steadily updated so that we know what's going on. It shouldn't be some investigation being done and we're just told it's been done. Tell us how far this is the state we are in. So we are proceeding this way. Of course, not to compromise the investigations, but then citizens, individuals should be updated on this. All right. All right. So we recall during the NSAS protests and that period, even before then and after, talking about the COVID-19 uh, loot, the warehouses that we saw all around the country, different parts of the country, warehouses that were stacked with COVID-19 palliatives and how they were looted. And the justifications that people put out to say that if the NDDC could mismanage 6.25 billion naira that was supposed to be used to feed them during that time of national lockdown, then they can as well go there and get the food stuff for themselves. So I want you to talk about how activities of the government like this, corruption, how it seems to now empower people to take laws into their own hands and cause vandalism like they did during the looting of the COVID-19 warehouses, the palliatives then. Rightly put, aptly put. Once um, government processes and frameworks don't work the way they should, would give room to the issues we saw just a few months ago, sometime around October, late October, and it's pretty terrible, really terrible. When justice is not served, when funds are misappropriated, when you leave people hungry, you give them no choice than they start behaving in those manner. And categorically, uh, I've uh, me, myself, my organization have been, of course, against vandalism and against acts like that, we don't endorse it. But then, these are ripple effects. Something led to this. A state actor, a duty bearer somewhere failed to use their office as enshrined by the mandate of that office. Someone misappropriated funds somewhere. And the result, we see chaos. The result, we see lootings. The result, we see scenes that are inhuman and not befitting of noble Nigerians. So certainly these things and these uh, uh, issues around mismanagement, around hoarding. In fact, at some point you saw when uh, some politician was using this as a souvenir for birthday and for party loyalists and branding Kaka COVID relief materials, branding COVID relief materials as theirs, personalizing them and selectively issuing them to party stalwarts. We've seen this over and over when in some states they're just giving to different party leaders. That's not fair. It's not a political party affair. It's a, something for all citizens, irrespective of political parties. So once you see the government starts behaving, government actors, state actors, start behaving in that manner, then it is a problem because citizens will be forced to also respond in manners that are not nice and are not palatable in line with how noble Nigerians should operate. So yes, certainly that's an issue. The resultant effect of all this thing is it creates um, uh, it creates riots and looting and all these things you saw in the land. The, the, are hungry. These um, uh, you know, this you know situation may not be very different from uh, the Abdul Rashid Mayna. Uh, case, you know, where of course is accused of mismanagement police pension funds. Um, do, how do you expect that this would play out um, in the long run? Of course, looking at our precedents also in the past of dealing with corruption cases of this magnitude, how do you expect that this one would also play out? I I I like to call myself an optimist, but then I also share concerns that with. Going by precedent and looking at history as a student of history, you see that um, if something is not done immediately, speedily, and rapidly, then we would have issues because this will be swept under the carpet. 
And it will be really, really very bad for Nigerians, and it will be used to score the current administration. Not good in their fight against corruption at different levels. So I think the onus is on the current government, the National Assembly, and of course the anti-corruption agencies to ensure that this is not swept under the carpet, rather this is actually investigated to the latter. Nigerians need answers. We demand answers. We say we don't have money, we don't have funds. We, you, you could look at how the budget is going. At some point, you reach that would have to maybe sell some items to fund the budget. You see, we are trying to borrow from some funds, some dormant accounts, and all of these things. It clearly shows we don't have money, and we need uh, there's a fiscal crisis, and we need funds. And then, when on the other hand, you're also saying we are looking at okay, the price of um, the price of petrol could go high because um, the price, the, the, the production cost is also going high. Um, the government said they are not going to pay subsidy again, so this price will go high. Uh, we look at increase in electricity tariffs and the rest. Citizens are bearing the burden around tax, um, around cost of um, buying products, cost of feeding and the rest. It's only fair that the government should have a posture that shows that it's also trying its best to cut waste. But then, when we are having allegations like this, and then you tell citizens you need to pay for this, you need to pay more for this. It doesn't go well. Why are you wasting money and you're telling me I have to pay for this? It's not, it doesn't show prudence. It's not, it's not good enough. All right. We've seen anti-corruption agencies that have come out to say that the stench of corruption in agencies like the NDDC is just too bad. To tackle this, would we need to set up an independence, you know, commission of judicial inquiry, or would we not need to start from the root cause of the individual looking at integrity? And how can we even achieve or guarantee that for our political office holders? You see, um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not a fan of duplicating efforts. Rather, I would say political interference should be taken away from these anti-corruption agencies. If you let our anti graph agencies work independently of any uh, political interference, if you let them do their job very well, if nobody disturbs them, nobody is trying to send a letter, no high profile GBRI is trying to um, twist one or two persons within these agencies, they will do their job perfectly well. Give them the independence they need. Don't interrupt them. Don't uh, politicize their actions, if anti-graph agencies are independent, then they will definitely do their work perfectly well. If they are independent and they have the resources they need, this will go far. And different individuals would behave themselves. Public um, office holders would try to stay clear of um, uh, issues around um, corruption and they would imbibe this integrity you're talking about. We've seen some efforts by uh, the, the ICPs who had its COVID-19 relief committee and the rest. We, we see them trying to give us one or two updates around those issues. If all anti-graph agencies have independence, they're allowed to function well. I mean, this would, this would be a, a, a thing of the past. This would be an issue. You could see other countries where presidents or the, the head of the government is standing for, I think, in Israel, prime minister is standing facing trial around um, uh, corruption allegations and the rest. If we have it here where you find um, anti graph agencies can summon heads of government and key individuals who they feel have not and um, have, have something to respond to or a question to respond to with them, then that's independence. And once we have all those kind of um, uh, environments for anti-corruption agencies here in Nigeria, they, be rest assured, rest assured they would function very well. They would do couldn't agree uh, more with you, Samuel Asimi, really. I mean, even in South Africa right now, the ex-president, Jacob Zuma, is facing corruption charges. You know, he's been summoned to appear. He's been summoned to answer, you know, in the corruption allegations that he has against him. But looking at Nigeria and, and our own peculiarity of the situation here, the slow arm of the law, how do you think that maybe even emboldens people to go ahead and carry out acts like this because they feel that you know there's basically no repercussion for their country for their action i think it's it's 
it's, 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 it's an issue that's lingered for long, and there are different factors that contribute to that. Um, we have politicization of this um, anti graft institution, so different person would feel like, okay, they could have their way. But to uh, the judiciary, of course, there are allegations of one or two um, allegations of nepotism, to be precise, around the appointments of uh, some judges within the judiciary by the NGC. I think a year ago or so, there was a little backlash by the public when eight of the third story um, individuals recommended to be appointed by the NGC were either relatives or children of seven or past justices of the appeal or Supreme Court. So when we have those issues, when people feel like um, those going into that area are already the, the, the way and manner in which they are attending the office is already questionable. When we have um, issues where uh, uh, anti-corruption agencies are not independent and they are being forced or um, twisted into doing the bidding of one or two certain individuals somewhere. When we have uh, all these scenarios like this, then all these factors will contribute to justice not being served. Mm. But if this is sorted out, if we have um, a speedy trial of issues, if we have uh, judicial independence, if we have a prosecutorial and investigative independence for politicization, would actually have this issue solved. All right. Mm. Samuel Asimi, uh, thank you so much uh, for your thoughts this morning and for sharing uh, your views on this very, very important uh, conversation across the country this morning. Looking forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. And we also hope that the Senate goes uh, through with um, what he has described. And it goes beyond just uh, conversations, you know, uh, at a Senate hearing. It goes beyond the drama that we normally would see um, when these conversations on the fight against corruption come up. Um, I believe that there should be more than just conversations. There should be um, a forensic audit. It, sh it shouldn't take so much um, to um, audit the books of the NDDC, audit the books of the COVID-19 um, spendings that they've had. And, you know, let us know exactly what is missing and where it has gone to. Um, it shouldn't be so hard. I, mean, I really don't know why it's so difficult. You know, I really don't know why myself. I mean, it's, it's almost 9 a.m. And in Sena Climbs, you would imagine that by this time, Ponde should be in, you know, where he should be with the police. You know, the arrest warrant should have been effected. But I won't be surprised if by the end of the week, nothing, nothing has happened, nothing has changed. And we continue to talk about the NDDC and the mismanagement of 6.25 billion now COVID-19 for the next two years. Yeah. Uh, th th these are still allegations, though, you know, so, but it makes it harder uh, to believe that, you know, there's not been, been mismanagement if they don't show up uh, to the Senate hearing. I am saying, aside the Senate hearing, when you hear of a magnitude of a, a crime um, allegations of this, this big, of this magnitude, you should go beyond just a Senate hearing. I don't know if there's a lot of senators who um, on that, you know, seat or, you know, in, in that uh, committee that know much about forensic, you know, auditing or finances, who know much about, you know, about, you know, that aspect. And mm -hmm. so... Beyond the questions of what did you do with this 40 million? Oh, you people used to organize meeting. Oh, you, there's a 500 million out here that it, you, you said you used to buy um, a grinding machine for people in Susanzo Village. Where is it? Besides that, there should be an actual forensic audit. And they're their qualified books. Nigerians yes. that we all know there's that so do many this. Of them. So, so many of them. Really, Tell us where the these funds is. went to. Whose bank accounts are these? Who paid for these contracts? Who awarded these contracts? Who bought these face masks? It's, it's, it's not so hard. But Shouldn't be, really. We'll see. Still talking COVID-19 next. And now we're talking vaccines. Um, it says, uh, the government says that in about 10 days, Vaccines might be arriving in Nigeria, and Nigerians might, of course, uh, start to receive their own vaccines. We'll get into that conversation right next, here on The Breakfast. <laughs>